Mm. All right, beautiful amen indeed. Um, here to affirm that Jesus is the cornerstone. Uh, but here's an ironic thing. As long as I've been following Jesus, the more I hang around him, um, the more he occasionally asks me to do things that make my life feel unsteady and wobbly and uncomfortable. <laughs> Can I get an amen? All right. Uh, this is the truth. Jesus is the cornerstone, but being around him can make you feel wobbly. Have you ever met somebody who is super friendly to everybody, but maybe also kind of edgy and offensive at the same time? Someone who you never quite knew what side they were on, because maybe they knew something that you weren't quite plugged into yet. Someone who could include everybody on the one hand, but keep everybody off balance at the same time? That almost sounds impossible, but Jesus was like that. In fact, Jesus is like that. 2,000 years ago, Jesus shows up in the middle of the Roman Empire. Was Jesus on Rome's side? No, for sure not. But did Jesus include Romans? Were Romans moved and compelled by the person they perceived from Jesus of Nazareth? Totally. Did Jesus make Romans angry? Yes, they crucified him on a Roman cross by the order of a Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Was Jesus on the nation of Israel's side 2,000 years ago? Sorry, if you haven't read the Bible much, these are rhetorical questions, right? It sounds like he should be on Israel's side, and he was born in Israel, religiously, genetically, racially. Was he on the nation? Of no, he wasn't. Did he include all kinds of Jewish folks and Israelites in his group of disciples? Yes. Did he make Israelites angry around the clock? Totally. Might the same be true today? And what is going on with it? Is Jesus on China's side? Is Jesus on the side of the United States of America? Is Jesus on Russia's side? Maybe he's on the side of Guatemala, right? Surprise, everybody. Right. probably he's on none of those sides in the same way that he wasn't on Rome's side or Greece's side or Israel's side. Whose side is Jesus on? He's on the side of the kingdom of God. He came to announce good news, the kingdom of God, something different and deeper and mind and spirit blowingly transcendent is what I have come to bring you guys. It is more eternal than any nation. It is deeper than any political co commitment. It runs deeper than whatever race you are or whatever mother tongue you speak. The kingdom of God is what Jesus talked about. And it both, if you really walked with Jesus, gave you a cornerstone to put your feet on solid ground and totally upset everybody. For 2,000 years, folks who love Jesus have been wanting Jesus just to bless our little brick or our little box. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus breasted the Christian Reformed side of Christianity? That's what our denomination is. But he doesn't do that, does he? Does Jesus favor the Roman Catholic brick of Christianity? Does he favor the Eastern Orthodox brick? No, Jesus is about the kingdom of God, and whenever the kingdom of God appears, that's where the spirit of the Lord is. Does Jesus favor people who just like Western classical music? Does Jesus favor the people who love guitars and praise bands? Does Jesus favor the Christian like rappers or people who just like have washboards and Christian bluegrass or native music from Guatemala, right? No, the kingdom of God is way deeper and bigger and wider and more lovely than any of our little expressions of what they might be. When Jesus was alive uh, in Israel, there were two kind of power groups uh, within the Israeli community, religiously speaking, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, since Easter, we've been talking about witnesses of the resurrection, and so far they have been individual people. The disciple John, the disciple Peter, Mary Magdalene. This morning, we're going to encounter this group that was around when Jesus walked the earth called the Sadducees. Together with the Pharisees, they made up something called the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish ruling council 
And unlike our current separation of church and state, back 2,000 years ago, that idea had not yet made it to humanity. So Jews had folks who had religious power and quite a bit of cultural and political sway as well. In pretty much every culture, there's a conservative force and a progressive force. The conservative force who's more content, all things equal, to keep things roughly the same and change sort of slow, and the progressive force that's like, we need to change everything as fast as possible, and let's try X, Y, and Z. Of course, we have this in the United States of America today in a different way, shape, or form. They had this 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> Surprisingly, uh, to me, the Pharisees, who are more, we would think, rule-following, super moralistic behavioral people, they were the more progressive force politically because they could not wait to get rid of the Romans and do everything as fast as possible to bring all power back into Israel. The Sadducees were doing quite well under Roman rule, so thank you very much. They were kind of conservatives, like, let's not rock the boat too much because we Sadducees are quite comfortable and wealthy and well-educated, so why would we want to like, change this formula anytime too soon? Did Jesus love and include these powerful Jewish folks 2,000 years ago? Yes. Some of them are named in the Bible, even a man named Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, and a man named Joseph of Arimathea, who was on the Jewish ruling count. Like some of these people, follow. did Jesus also totally annoy, upset, and jab these powerful folks 2,000 years? Yes, at every possible corner. So who are these Sadducees exactly? Um, they were priests. Um, every Sadducee was a priest, but not every priest was a Sadducee, if I can put it that way. Um, they were the equivalent of kind of the priestly, like an aristocracy. They were doing well. They were the Ivy League of ancient Judaism. They were the folks who had gone to school the longest. They probably thought they were the smartest. They had every economic advantage. Here are a few of their distinctive beliefs, and these actually differentiate them from the Pharisees. Number one, they had a strong emphasis on the book of Moses, what we call the first five books of the Bible, what Jewish folks call the Pentateuch. Um, not that they didn't believe the rest of the Old Testament scriptures, but there was a special spotlight on those first five books. This is going to come back in just a few minutes. Their second belief, you might find this surprising, was a denial of the resurrection. So this was a core belief, this is a core belief of Christians for the last 2,000 years. It was a belief of the Pharisees 2,000 years ago, but the possibility of a bodily resurrection not on the scorecard of the Sadducees. In fact, in a scene that I like to call Biblical Fight Club, in the book of Acts, chapter 23, a man named Paul, who is on trial in front of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, brings up exactly this point. Paul says, I'm on trial here today because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And then the Bible says this. When Paul had said that, a giant dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees because the Sadducees say that there's no resurrection and that there are no angels or spirits, but Pharisees believe in all of these things. By the way, Paul effectively de delayed his trial by just getting them to fight against each other. How clever. Third, uh, the Sadducees pretty much denied the spiritual realm. They were materialists. What you see is what you get. If you can see it, if you can hear it, if you can put your hands on it, if you can test it, I mean in a lab, we would say these days, that's what they believed in not stuff that you can't see. I mean, this sounds very modern, right? There's no new idea under the sun. 2,000 years ago, they believed what you see is what you get about the world and about the universe. And because of that, the fourth thing that I just want to point out for you is that these Sadducees emphasized human decision-making uh, and freedom of the will and our personal power to make stuff happen as opposed to divine will or God's will, or God's plan and purposes. 
uh, an ancient historian, a guy named Josephus, who was a Jew who lived in the first century AD, said this about the Sadducees. They suppose that all human actions are within our very own power so that we ourselves are the cause of everything that is good and evil. Again, does this not sound super modern? People who don't believe in any unseen realm, folks who are not concerned about God's plans or God's purposes, who are just like what it boils down to is just what I decide, who I say I am, and how I invent my own existence out here in the world. The spotlight for the Sadducees and we modern people is again and again on us rather than the spotlight being on God. Sadducees are mentioned by name in the New Testament about a dozen times. But whenever the group chief priests are mentioned in the New Testament, which is dozens and dozens and dozens of times, the Sadducees are included in that group. So they're all over the pages of the Gospels. Um, here's a remarkable thing. Nowhere in the New Testament does it specifically point out a Sadducee who walked with Jesus or responded to the good news of the kingdom of God in a positive way. There's one especially remarkable scene in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, where the Sadducees gather around Jesus in the city of Jerusalem. There's a big crowd around, and their whole point in hanging out with Jesus on this day is to undermine him and to test him. What a great group of folks, right? I hope that was not your motivation coming to church this morning. We will have a question and answer uh, after worship today. They wanted their question and answer period uh, to bring Jesus down a couple of notches. So here's the scene. Let's read together from Mark chapter 12. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. A teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Okay, number one, this might seem weird to us, but culturally speaking, 2,000 years ago, society operated in a much more patriarchal way. And if a woman was married and her husband died, there was a serious problem for her protection and for her economic provision. One of the ways in Jewish culture to protect and provide for a widow was that a man's brother would then marry his former sister-in-law and bring her under the protection of his roof and the economic protection of his household. So that's what's going on in the background of the story. Okay, now here's the stumping question that they want to ask Jesus. Can we go to the next slide? Sadducees say, now Jesus, there's seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. So the second one marries the widow. But then he also dies and leaves no child. It's the same with the third brother. In fact, all seven <laughs> married this woman, didn't leave any children. Last of all, the woman dies too. Now, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since she was married to all seven of these brothers? Huh, Jesus? Huh? What do you say about that? Oftentimes, when people are trying to be so smart, we prove ourselves to be so dumb. They are trying to stump Jesus, and uh, this is probably not going to work out. Here is Jesus' amazing reply. I would love to know his tone of voice. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Now he is speaking to know-it-alls, like the Ivy League Harvard-Yale graduates. And his question is, Are you not in error because you don't even know the Bible? And you don't know anything about the power of God, you people who are just free will materialist humanists? Gotta love Jesus, right? If they were not annoyed with him before this, they are super annoyed and angry right now. Jesus goes on. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. This is describing us, by the way. Now about the dead rising... Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You smart people. 
are badly mistaken. Oh, <laughs> it's amazing that another biblical fight club didn't break out like right then. Jesus points out to the Sadducees, you guys, you might think you know a lot, but you don't know anything about the scriptures. Jesus could have quoted to them from different Old Testament books like Psalm 16, which says, you will not let your faithful one see decay. You have made known to me the, pres- the path of life and you fill me with joy in your presence and eternal pleasures at your right hand. Like there's little signs of the resurrection in the Old Testament. Jesus could have quoted them the book of Job uh, where Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has rotted and been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Jesus could have quoted some of those signs of the resurrection to them, but no, knowing that they emphasize the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, Jesus goes to Exodus chapter 3. That's what we would call it anyways. Part of what they really rely on as the word of God. And Jesus points out that when God revealed to Moses his name, God said this, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And by saying, I am, God is saying, Abraham, he's still alive in my presence with me. Isaac, still alive. Jacob, still alive. Jesus is pointing out that even in the very beginning of Scripture, there's these signs where God is hinting at, if you are with God, if you are in Christ, if your life is in him, like, you are going to live because his life lives forever, and his life lives through you. Sometimes we smart people are ignoramuses. Jesus also points out to the Sadducees that they don't know anything about the power of God. Indeed, they kind of disavowed themselves from knowing very much about the power of God. It's human power that mattered to them. Now, resurrection power the kind of power that Jesus is talking about, the kind of power that raised him from the dead on the first Easter Sunday morning, like, that is a massive, like, nuclear power plant amount of power. Like, thankfully, I believe God in his mercy does not subject any of us to, like, that amount of power at the same time. If you have to recharge a car battery, um, you can have this thing called a trickle charger, that just adds a low-level, steady stream of power to, like, revive and resurrect the battery. Like, God, please treat me like that in the course of my life. Like, don't give me all the resurrection power at once. Give me the slow trickle charge that keeps me coming back to life and being renewed day after day after day. The Sadducees didn't believe in either of these things. Jesus knew that just a few weeks later, After Easter Sunday morning, they would not believe either. Jesus knew that they thought that Abraham was dead, that Isaac was still dead, that Jacob's bones were just rotting in the grave, even though the Bible says they are alive in God's presence. In fact, the Sadducees were so hard-headed at this point that after the first Easter, after they knew the eyewitness testimony, after they heard from people around Jerusalem that Jesus of Nazareth was back serving people breakfast, performing miracles, showing up in upper rooms, Matthew 28, verse 13, says the Sadducees asked the Roman guards who were there on Easter Sunday Sunday morning to say this, you are to say Jesus' disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. This is like the original denial of the resurrection. Like, We know something happened, but here's the excuse. Really, they came and stole Jesus' body, so the resurrection couldn't have happened. That's the Sadducees' story, and they're going to stick to it. Willful ignorance. Willful denial of the evidence. Their learning, their education, their good brains, their material success... All of that actually got in the way and became an obstacle from that from them being able to believe in Jesus. Does that sound at all familiar to you? 
This is a lot like our modern predicament in a nutshell, that we have so much learning, so much knowledge, scientifically especially, technology, so much material success that the possibility of a resurrection for a Jewish guy 2,000 years ago, and even if that did happen, why it wouldn't make a difference for everybody all these years later, it's just, it seems beyond the beyond to so many of us modern people. There's a Roman Catholic bishop by the name of um, Robert Barron, very intelligent guy. He's actually the Roman Catholic after the Pope was the biggest social media presence uh, in the world. Um, about a year ago, this guy um, published a piece and had a Q&A on Reddit about what's going on with young people in the Roman Catholic Church. And he presented some recent sociological evidence and surveys about what's going on with their young adults. And it turns out that more than 50% of young Roman Catholics now identify themselves as religious nuns, meaning I have no religious commitment or belief structure. And for every one young adult who joins the Roman Catholic Church, six are leaving. Do you hear me right on that? For every one that joins, six are leaving. Like, this is happening in every denomination around the Western world and in North America. To some degree, these same trends are at work in our community. Like, it's a hard time to be a young person and hang on to faith. And what is going on? Robert Barron has concluded this, again, from these surveys, that the number one reason by far from Roman Catholics now, young people, is that they simply do not believe the teachings of the church. It's not the scandals with the priest. It's not the lousy pastors. It's not the quality of the music that are on the top of the chart. Is that young people simply cannot believe the core teachings of the church, that God made everything, that sin is the number one problem with the human race, that Jesus saves, and that he came back from the dead and is someday returning again to make all things new. Like young people, and if you're a young person here today, if you like have doubts about this, if you are having a hard time squaring your education with what just came out of my mouth, you are not alone. One of the issues is that we have so much learning and so much of our learning comes on the material side that we start to think that everything that could be true needs to be able to be verified in a lab or by physicists or by epidemiologists or by biologists. I am not bagging on science at all. Here's my statement for you this morning. If it is true, it is true because it comes from God. Like everything about God is true, whether it's in the scripture or whether it's in an evolutionary biology lab. Like, if it's true and real, God is right there in the center of it. Our problem is that we walk around with this bifurcated reality and somehow think that maybe the Bible is trying to teach about scientific things when that is not the agenda of the Bible. They are apples and oranges, in my opinion, which doesn't mean they're not both beautiful and tasty fruits. <laughs> and that God is not the one who grew both of them up. But when we put pressure on the Bible to produce the kind of truth that comes out of our modern scientific labs, we try to squash the Bible and tear it into something that God never intended for it to be. Now, we know deep down that there are all kinds of truths that do not come out of a science lab, right? Like, what makes for a good friend? That is an important truth that a physics class will not teach you about unless you have a lab partner, right? <laughs> but the truth is not going to come out of an experiment. How do you manage your anger? How do you construct a healthy marriage? Like the most important things about life, the Bible speaks to all of these things and those, you know, this is why we read Hamlet. This is why people love Harry Potter books because on a smaller level, like great literature speaks to these things as well. So please, 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 young adults especially, create room in your soul and spirit that the Bible and science are not one and the same. And that when the Bible talks to us about our identity and our purpose in life 
and meaning in the universe, it is telling us profound truths that science is never going to get us in the neighborhood of. This is the mistake of the Sadducees, and it is exactly our modern mistake. Now, there's some hopeful things in this. Robert Barron points out that just because young adults are leaving the church, spiritual curiosity is actually climbing. So it's not as if everybody is writing off God and is writing off their spiritual curiosity. It's just that the answers that those of us in the older generations are offering these days are not working. So I'm promising you, (laughs) going to try to work hard at this, both in Sunday morning worship and behind the scenes, to create room because the most important thing that we older people want to see, the most important gift that we want to give, is to see the life of faith grow up in those of you who are younger. There is a short phrase that sums up what I'm trying to say. It has popped up many different times in the history of Christianity, and it is this. Faith-seeking understanding. Ultimately, you have to stand on a cornerstone or a foundation. And I choose to stand on the cornerstone of what God's word says and put everything else that's true in the world like gets built on top of that commitment. If you have, nope, it's the science lab and I need to force anything that I would believe spiritually into something that's scientifically verifiable, you will end up with very little meaning or purpose or possible identity or comfort in your life. Like, I'm sorry to say that's how it works. So if you're, if you're a young person especially, I ask you to consider the possibility of making faith in God's word your cornerstone. And it doesn't mean that you can't grow up to be an engineer or an evolutionary biologist or a great physicist. There are all of those kind of people in the world who love Jesus as well. Francis Collins, uh, the leader of the Human Genome Project, is a beautiful Christian guy who came to Christ in the midst of all of his scientific brilliance. Like, these things, because the one real cornerstone exists, are totally able to be married. So back to the Sadducees, the last word. In the days of the early church, the Sadducees were very active. With the chief priests and the captain of the temple guard in Acts chapter 5, they arrested Peter and John. Later, they arrested all of the apostles. I don't know if that just means the 12 or if that means like the burgeoning group of apostles who are starting to go out in Jesus' name. They addressed all of them. And these Sadducees talked about killing them on the spot. It's a very like colorful story, the end of Acts chapter 5. This hostility continued. The historian Josephus says that the Sadducees actually were responsible for killing James, the brother of Jesus. There are no stories in the early church or in the Bible about a Sadducee coming to faith in Christ or following Jesus. When the Jerusalem temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, the Sadducees disappeared into the rubble of history along with that temple, never to be seen or heard from again. They were super successful. They were super smart. But their way of life, their commitments, it was a path to nowhere. Dear friends, let us not walk in their footsteps on a path to nowhere. But let us keep in step with Jesus who came proclaiming the kingdom of God and putting down a cornerstone of faith that seeks understanding. Will you pray with me? God, Lord Jesus, we thank you that this life is not all that there is, that you give the gift of faith, and we thank you that indeed in Christ the dead will rise. Help us and help our young people in particular to frame our struggles our doubts, and our uncertainties in this life in the light of all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.